Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Mark Moss. Mark is a successful investor and entrepreneur who has a knack for marketing. He runs a YouTube show with over 258,000 subscribers that eloquently discusses his investment ideas. Often, Bitcoin is discussed, and Mark's most popular video with almost a million views discusses his theories on the war on cash. In this episode, Doug seeks to understand Mark's strong Bitcoin conviction and where Monero fits into his thesis, especially considering Mark's strong warnings that cash is under attack. At one point, Doug brings up the development of Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps as an example of how active the Monero project is and how fears of delistings killing Monero's liquidity are probably moot. It should be noted, since recording, it has been announced that the Comet team has taken BTC XMR atomic swaps from testnet to mainnet. Monero talk starts now. All right, Mark, we're good. All right, all right. Why do, you use this? Why do you use this instead of just using like uh, Zoom or something? Uh, most people in the Monero community, I like appreciate using Jitsi cause there's, there's no accounts. Um, Got it. you just go to a link. So, you know, I, I, uh, I cater to the obsessed privacy community. Got it. Got it. Okay. I, I'm, I'm like, uh, obviously, you know, I'm a big privacy advocate. Um, uh, that's why I'm a Monero advocate, but for me, it's, it's not just about privacy. I mean, we'll, I'm sure we'll get into it. It's more so about fungibility as to why, uh, you know, I think Monero is, is so important. Yeah. That's what's, that's what sparked the invite for the show. So let's, let's talk about that. I would consider myself a privacy advocate too. All right. So we got you sold. You're, you're a Monero guy. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I wrote a cryptocurrency only research newsletter for four years. Um, and so I wrote uh, super in-depth research on all the cryptocurrency coins from like 2016 to 2019, mm -hmm. um, including the privacy coins. I was a huge advocate of privacy coins. Um, but I've just, uh, I've kind of evolved my positions on it since, but, um, but I'm a huge privacy advocate and I've, I've written extensively about most of the privacy coins that are out there. Very cool. Yeah, so I kind of went the opposite route. So I started off as a Bitcoiner, like late 2013, early 2014. Actually, Dogecoin was my, my first purchase in like 2013. Should, should have never sold my Doge. Should have never sold yeah. my Doge. Um, and that took me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. So I bought Doge without understanding anything. You know, I actually stored it yeah. on an online wallet. And the next day I woke up, it was Christmas morning. I woke up and my, my fifty dollars worth of Doge was gone, but it set uh, me it set me down the uh, the crypto rabbit hole. I was like, "There's no way crypto works like this." I'm like, "This seems like a horrible invention." And then yeah. um, I you know read the Satoshi white paper. I I understood you know it clicked for me decentralization. Wow, this is amazing. They figured it out, and uh, I was a Bitcoin maxi. You know, I was uh, I was all in. You know, didn't have a lot of money at the time, but. Any, anything I had, I was throwing into Bitcoin and I wrote it all the way down because that, that was like the, you know, remember the like the 2013 bull market sure. and ran it all the oh, way yeah. down. And uh, I, I was rooting for it to go down at that point, you know. And um, it was when I really started to move my Bitcoin around, you know, send, I would send some to friends and uh, try to get them into Bitcoin. It was really when I started to use it that I started to uh, become worried about the fact that not only is it 
uh, not as private as I thought, but it was the complete opposite of private. It was actually you broadcast every single transaction to the world for the world to see. And that's what led me to Monero. And when I found Monero, uh, I fell in love with it. Um, it has a story very similar to that of Bitcoin. You know, also started anonymously, started by uh, Nicholas Van Saberhagen. Like you said, you, you researched, so I'm sorry you came across all these stories. Um, so very similar to Bitcoin in many ways. Um, launched in reaction to Bitcoin to solve what it saw as some of Bitcoin's problems. And uh, that's what took me down the Monero road. Yeah. Um, but you said your, your, I guess your thesis has changed and evolved. So what has it evolved from to? Yeah. So great, uh, great starting point. So um, I come from a, uh, you know, I, I, my perspective, if, if you've watched any of my content, uh, it always draws in historical perspective. So I'm a student of history, um, uh, lots of different history from lots of different perspectives. Um, one of those being the history of money, monetary principles and whatnot. Um, another one that I've studied extensively, I'm actually doing some talks around Miami on, is uh, technological cycles and the history of technology and technological revolutions. So not just technology, but technological revolutions. There's only been five technological revolutions in the last 250 years. Um, like I said, not new technologies, but revolutions that have like literally changed humanity. So that's... Um, the industrial revolution brought people out of the fields into the factories, um, steam, steam ships and uh, steam engines and, and steel, right? Steel, who we went from building two stories and bricks to building skyscrapers and bridges, um, went to electricity. Obviously, that was huge. Not only did it give us lights when we've been in dark for years, but I mean, it allows us to do what we're doing today. Um, automobiles was huge in 1900s. 1971 was the microprocessor. If you keep track, it's about every 50 to 60 years is new technology. Um, now we're in a, in a decentralization technology uh, revolution. Um, but when you go back and you look at all those um, revolutions and you look at the way technologies actually roll out. And so all new technologies have a uh, kind of a repeatable pattern. And um, I'm old enough to have uh, started my investing career in the dot-com age. And so I was in my early 20s when the dot-com dot, dot boom happened. And so there's a lot of similarities. And so let me, let me just break a couple down for you, and we can dive into that if you want. But um, if you look at, let's say, the automobile boom, for example, in the 1900s, um, like any new technology, a new technology is invented. Um, people get very, very excited about it. It draws in a ton of speculators, and those speculators try to find every single idea and way they can make money. Very quickly, there was 250 automobile manufacturers. But guess what? The problem was two things. One, the market couldn't support 250 automobiles. There weren't people for that. But two, the infrastructure wasn't there. There was no roads. There was no um, gas stations. There was no automobile parts stores, etc. And so what happened is those 250 automobile manufacturers went out of business and we ended up with three, Ford, Chrysler, GM. Uh, we saw the same thing happen in the dot-com boom. Um, and so in the dot-com boom, um, uh, I'm old enough to have remembered that, like I said, in 97, uh, I was on the chat rooms on AOL, and uh, we can send this electronic mail. It was really cool. Um, and what happened is, of course, all the speculators came in, all the inventors and whatnot. And by 98, 99, we had every dot-com in the world. And um, the famous ones were webvan.com and pets.com. And the thing about that was that it wasn't that they were wrong, just like the automobile manufacturers. They were right. And today we, of course, order our food online and we buy, we buy our pet stuff online. Yeah. The problem was the same thing, which is one, there was no market for it. Nobody was buying anything online back then. But two, also the infrastructure didn't support it. The internet was too slow. It didn't even work for that. So um, the speculators got ahead of what the market could support. And I see the exact same thing playing out. And so that's kind of what's changed my vision. So Back in 2016, 17, 18, as I'm writing that cryptocurrency research newsletter, um, we can solve everything with cryptocurrency, right? We can do supply chain and privacy and, you, you know, whatever, you name it. Um, and, and I don't think any of that was wrong. It's the same thing that happened with automobiles, same thing that happened with the internet days. Uh, what changes, though, is, is two things, right? Same thing, the market and the technology. And so the market wasn't there to support 8,000 cryptocurrencies doing 8,000 things. Doesn't mean they're wrong, just the market wasn't there, but also the infrastructure wasn't there. And so um, the best way to look at it would be kind of back to those internet days. Um, so if you remember those times, um, all these big Fortune 500 companies, they said, 
we can't be on this open internet. That's too dangerous. We're going to build a private intranet. And so we had you know, hundreds or thousands of these intranets being built. Billions of dollars were spent. Um, but of course, today, all those internets are gone and everything's built on one single internet. The other thing that's important to understand, this is a very key piece, when you understand how technologies work, technologies work in layers. And the reason why this is a super important piece to understand is because everything is built off of a base. So like I was a real estate investor for, well, I still am. I built tons and tons of real estate, commercial and residential. But you start with the foundation. You pour a flat, dumb, flat piece of concrete. But that dumb, fat, flat piece of concrete allows me to build anything on top of it. And then as I go up in layers, I get more intricate. So we have like the internet, for example, it's built on a TCP IP you know, protocol. Um, it's a very dumb, slow protocol. But on top of it, I can build HTTPS. I can build security. I can build SMTP. I can build internet. Pro so the problem is if that base layer was too complex or had too many things built into it, it limits the amount of things that I can build on top of it. And so that's a very key piece of how these technologies roll out. And so now that we're in 2021 and we're seeing things, uh, what we're able to see now today with the way the technology is advanced is that Bitcoin, let's call it a dumb, slow base layer. Sure. But the benefit to that is it allows us to build almost anything in the world on top of it. So using Lightning today, I can already send Bitcoin faster, cheaper, and more private than any other coin out there using a layer that. two yeah. using a layer two solution. Um, and so we'll continue to get more things to build on top of it, but all the complexity gets built on layers as opposed to trying to change the base layer. So that, that's, that's, I think, what's changed my overall picture. Uh, yeah, okay, I get that. So... But you, you think – so you're, you're a, a one coin to rule them all? You become one of those guys? Uh, well, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Um, there's um, – it depends on what you consider a coin. So let me say this. So I believe there's one internet and I don't believe there's a reason to have other internets. Now, there are lots of networks within that internet. Um, there's obviously lots of applications built on top of that internet. There's not one website to rule them all. I don't believe in that. Uh, but there is one internet. And so I guess that's what I would say. I think there's um, no reason to have a bunch of internets. Um, I think there's a reason to have one. Using Tor, I can use the same internet but in a much more private way. Um, so uh, use, you know, there's all types of applications I can create private, private groups or public groups or whatever, but it's on one internet. And so I would see the same thing happening – um, just like all those thousands of intranets went away, and eventually everything was built on the one single base layer. I just see a vision where everything is built on one single base layer. Now, does that mean there's not multiple coins? No, not at all. There could be tons of different coins. And there could be smart contracts and privacy this and open source this and all that. I just don't see a reason to have thousands of, of, of intranets or base layers. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I, I pretty much agree with everything you're saying, I guess. Uh, it just boils down to how much of a purist you are. I think we, I think we kind of, I assume we agree on the, from what I'm hearing you say, we assume on what we agree on what the value proposition of uh, Bitcoin is and crypto in general. Which well, I don't, uh, I don't, want, I don't, I don't know. We I don't, haven't discussed what the value proposition is, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, we'll, we'll go into. But I assume I mean I watched some of your videos, so I assume you, you think you know a censorship resistant value sure. transfer network. Is that is right. that fair enough? So, um, you know, I, I totally agree with that. That's why I'm so excited about crypto. I think it's uh, a blessing. Uh, you know, I was I was very concerned with the direction, still am, with the direction the world was moving in. Uh, I think you voiced a lot of these opinions on your show. Yeah. Um, uh, certainly concerned about, you know, the siren servers of Facebook and Google and mass surveillance. And it seemed like we were going down a very dark path that really had, really had no solution. Uh, and crypto seems to be that solution. It's offering uh, a new incentive model where uh, the outcome is a more decentralized future instead of centralized one. And um, where, where I kind of branch off from Bitcoin is in my belief that what we need more than anything is a censorship resistant network that is truly decentralized and that's essentially bulletproof. Um, and totally agree, all about the base layer. 
I believe so much in the, in the base layer concept that I think you need to make sure that base layer is as well built as possible before you start, you know, moving things to the second layer. And I guess really where, you know, min, uh, hardcore Monero people differ with hardcore Bitcoin people is in this thought as to whether or not privacy needs to be built into the protocol layer itself, which gets to the whole fungibility argument. So I guess would love to hear your reasoning as to why you don't think it's necessary to have, or I don't want to put words in your mouth, maybe you do, or why you, you, know, why you believe that Bitcoin uh, isn't making a sacrifice there by not having fungibility pri sure. and privacy built into the core protocol level. Well, what, well, what I would say, there's a, there's a couple things to unpack there. So first thing that I would say is that uh, while I do share your uh, agree, you know, I do agree that censorship resistant immutability is uh, paramount, right? It's, it's, uh, it's probably, you know, the top uh, principles to optimize for in my position, uh, from my, from my view. But there's other, there's, there's a couple other ones that are pretty important as well. And so another one that's very important to me is having a fixed monetary supply. And in order to have that fixed monetary supply, well, any system that we have, and it's the problem with the U.S. dollar system, it's the problem that we have a centralized control on the Internet and Facebook and whatnot, is it always requires trust, right? Because there's, there's, there's no visibility, there's no transparency, so it always requires trust. And so um, with Bitcoin, we say, don't trust, verify. And so because Bitcoin, it's to your point you mentioned earlier, Bitcoin is not private, you're correct, it is anonymous, now, using t tools like Chainalysis, they can use AI and try to tie things together, but really they get you on the on and off ramps. If you just used it in a true Bitcoin environment, they would never be able to tie that together. However, put that aside for a minute. The point being that, um, the point being is that in order to have a trustless system where we don't have to trust on anybody, um, it has to be um, open where people have visibility. So with the Bitcoin network, we can know at any given time and point and day or whatever how much Bitcoin are on the network and exactly where they are. And one of the problems that I would see in a, a base layer protocol that has, uh, you know, that privacy built in, as you say, like with Monero, is you don't have that visibility. And so now I have to trust the Monero network that how many coins and where they are. And so that's a big differentiation yeah, but you, uh, right off the bat. Just, just if you don't mind, can I can I uh, get in on that topic? Can we go yeah, down that yeah, road? Because that, that's, yes, I mean, that that kind of is one of the you know the main threads of like you know Bitcoin v Monero, and uh, I and I should say too, you know, I don't necessarily think you know it's just going to be a purely Bitcoin world or a purely Monero world. I think you know, like we said, some strong projects could uh, you know live together side by side, right? So. Uh, just to get that out of the way, I'm not like a super Mon well. I am a Monero Maxi, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I could, you know, I could see a world where where there are multiple protocols living side by side. Um, but yeah, with the, with the trust issue, um, you know, I had that same issue when I was getting into Bitcoin, and I'm sure you did too. And you know, even then, it was a little bit earlier days. There were uh, some hiccups with the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, we, you know, we did see. Uh, you know, glitch where almost coins were uh, secretly, you know, uh, extra coins were, were, were added to the network and it was caught. Um, we, there were fears of, you know, 51% attacks. There were fears that, you know, there, there could be bugs or glitches in the code itself. You know, when I started going, you know, taking the few dollars I had at the time and putting it all into Bitcoin, these were real concerns I had. And over time, I, I, you know, I'm not a programmer myself. Um, I began to trust more in the protocol as I researched it more and researched those who do have the chops to actually audit and understand the code. And so the trust isn't completely eliminated in Bitcoin, right? You're trusting in the math. You're trusting in the cryptography. Um, you know, you're, you're basically trusting in encryption, right? I, I don't... I, I don't know about you, but I don't have the, the PhD to truly understand encryption on a mathematical level. I do know that, you know, um, it's, it's not a, a law of nature as to whether or not encryption can, can or can't be broken. You know, uh, 
with enough computing power, there's, you know, especially with quantum computing, there's, you know, there's I, theories that, that it could uh, very well be broken. So there's, there's trust in Bitcoin, in, in, the, in, in the math, in the code, and in those that are reviewing it and implementing it. And so that same trust uh, is required for Monero. It's just an additional layer of abstraction in one element of the code which is being able to essentially count up all the coins, right? So, uh, well, you know, me, because me. I can't do it with my TI-82 and looking at the ledger, you know, I'm no longer going to trust it. But you've already trusted so much. It's like you're already in a spaceship, you know? You're already flying in a spaceship. You're trusting in the technology, in the engineers that built that spaceship. But now you're not willing to trust, you know, some next layer of abstraction on top of that. Um, and I just don't, you know... Why, why I'm okay with that is because you're getting so much on the other side, which is fungibility, which is privacy, which I think is critical if we want this technology to survive and actually yield us liberty as we proceed down you know, this scary path that we were talking about. Yeah, let me, let me just uh, add to kind of what you're saying there because I think there's, there's – a, a small, a couple, couple small nuances. I think that make the difference, right? So, um, you're you're absolutely right. You know, I'm not a I'm not a cryptography specialist. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Um, so I I do have to trust, right, a little bit. But it's not it's not what you it's not how you laid it out in my perspective. And so what do I mean by that? So, um, unlike uh, every other application that's out there in the world, it has proprietary code. And so the, the maker of that software, whether it's Microsoft Windows or Facebook code, um, they don't allow it to be open so other developers can't go in and build on that and whatnot. And so there's that, that, that hiddenness that I don't know what's going on. We don't know how the algorithm works on YouTube or, or Facebook, for example. Um, whereas Bitcoin is open source. Now, I'm not a cryptography expert. However, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them that are. And so um, I'm not trust. Nobody is stuck trusting um, the network. Nobody is stuck trusting the code. I guess to your point, though, we are somewhat trusting the community of thousands of decentralized users who are experts. And at this point, um, if the thousands or tens of thousands of experts that have complete access because it's all open source had found a problem, I think we would have found out about it by now. Uh, but to your point, I am trusting a decentralized community of tens of thousands of people that they haven't found it. Uh, but I trust in that more. So when I'm stuck choosing who I trust, I'm stuck trusting something that's completely open, that, that's been viewed by tens of thousands of people in a community, um, all sharing the same ethos, um, than trusting something that has no visibility and they haven't given that to me. Um, that, but that being said, um, I just think that a, a very, very, very key piece and, and almost – I don't. I mean, almost as important as the decentralized nature of it is the fixed monetary supply. And so, oh, wait, Bitcoin, Mark. Mark, just before we proceed, I'm sorry. Just be, but Monero has the same open source nature, uh, developed, launched in the same way. It's the third most developed coin. Uh, you know, there, there's super geniuses working on this code. A lot of people that you know have worked on Bitcoin, worked on Monero. It's also equally open source. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's very much well known and respected for that, even among, uh, you know, Bitcoiners and BTC Max. Right. So there's, but the, there's but no, the point, but the point was both, about both, both of them. The, the, the argument I was trying to make was that they're, they're both in that same category, right? You're, you're trusting in this open source project called Bitcoin or you're trusting in this open source project called Monero. Except, except for except for trusting the monetary supply. So like I said, we know exactly how many Bitcoin there are today and where they're all at on the network at this given second. And we don't know that with Monero. So that's the piece. Yeah, that but you, you also don't know if, if, you know, the elliptic curve cryptography behind Bitcoin can be broken. So it's, just, it's the same. There's, you're, you're still trusting the math. You're still trusting the, the engineers. So, But if, if it was broken, we would know versus on Monero, if the mon monetary supply was different, we wouldn't know. You'd, you'd arguably know faster, right? You'd arguably know faster, but you know at that point, broken is broken, right? So, so I run, you know, so I can run a Bitcoin node, and uh, I can verify the network, you know, in real time. And so, you know, it, it just comes down to what you optimize for. And I, and I, I fully appreciate that some people optimize other features over others. Like some people just want the fastest coin, like speed to them is their their main primary focus. 
Uh, for me, uh, the censorship resistant is equally important as that fixed monetary supply and the ability for me to. Well, prepare. it equally has a fixed monetary supply, though. I don't. I just don't want to mince. I just don't want to get the false information out there. You know. You're, they, they you're, both... you're absolutely right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, Bitcoin and and, and, and Monero are very very similar. Yeah, I'll give you. Uh, it's, but it doesn't give me the ability to verify that because of the because because of the privacy. It's a trade off. Everything and so you, that's, you, could that's you could run a full you could run a full node. You could you could run the on the command line and you could ask it to add up all the you know all the essentially Coinbase releases and you'll you'll see that now you're trusting that that code was properly implemented. Yes, yes, of yeah. course. So I think you know the one thing that I think really sets the stage for this conversation and uh, and it was actually Vitalik Buterin you know put it out what he called the the trilemma, right? So um, everything in life, you know, cryptography or, or, or crypto or whatever, everything in life is about trade-offs, right? So you're always trying to optimize one over the other. And so we just have to understand as we have this conversation that um, each of us could be optimizing for different features and that's okay because we're different, we're individuals. Totally um, but we do have to understand that each one gives a trade-off. And so you just have to say, well, the trade-off is worth it to me or it's not worth it to me. And so um, at that point, we could agree to disagree or whatever, but I think that's just an important point to get out. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. It's uh, this design decisions were made, and you know, I think people are you know literally putting their their money where their mouth is and deciding you know which ones they think um, you know are are really more aligned essentially with their philosophical beliefs is really what it comes down to. I think. Um, I want to get to the I want to get to the fungibility piece that you sure, mentioned, but. Sure. But before we do real quick, the other thing I'll just add, and maybe this kicks up another conversation, but um, again, so back to kind of understanding how technology works in like layers. So I can have the base layer without the privacy, um, which gives then gives me the trustless base layer that I need to verify that. And then I can just add the privacy that I want so much on layer two. So I can transact over lightning peer to peer directly with you and nobody has any visibility to that. Um, and so, you know, I believe that, um, not all transactions need to be uh, immutable. Um, if I buy a cup of coffee from Starbucks, I don't really care if that's on the main chain. And so all those transactions are off the main chain. Um, and so we, we, we can, I feel like I can kind of have my cake and eat it too. Yeah. And I, I guess what I would say to you is, you know, I'm all, all for the layer technology and, you know, I, my, I am an engineer, so I, you know, I, I do have a good basic understanding. I'm, I'm a patent attorney by trade. Uh, so I'm not totally uh, non-technical. Well, I'm dealing with an attorney here. Uh, you should have told me ahead of time. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a physics guy. You know, that was my, my thing. So I, I do I do have the ability to understand systems and things like that. Um, and so I totally agree. You know, at some point, you're going to need a layer for, for blockchain uh, to scale, whether it's Monero or Bitcoin. So, uh, you know, I think the future will be a layer built on, on Bitcoin. Uh, and there'll be a, a similar Lightning Network built on top of Monero. Uh, but I want one where, you know, the base layer is is really where the fungibility is so that there aren't any holes. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's you know, I mean, just using basic common sense, right? So if, if your base layer uh, is lacking in something, uh, it seems kind of physically impossible to add that to the second thing, if it's something fundamental, right? I'm sure you would agree that you couldn't have a base layer that lacks censorship resistance, but then you're adding censorship resistance to the second layer, right? Like you, you wouldn't, yeah, th you wouldn't uh, think that's possible, but for no, some no, no. reason we're willing to say, oh, that is possible with, with privacy. Uh, and I would argue it, it's not. I would argue that's just as fundamental to the nature of what this stuff needs to be. Um, and if you want it to be truly, you know, decentralized and censorship resistant, you got to build, bake that into the core base. And then you could go ahead and build your, your additional layers on top. Um, and, you know, there's there's those in the Monero community and elsewhere and even in the Bitcoin community that have arguments against uh, Lightning Network in terms of how private it actually is, uh, whether or not governments may treat, uh, you know, Lightning nodes as money transmitters, uh, whether or not, uh, you know, practically speaking, you're going to be able to onboard everybody from the main chain to the second layer when you're only doing uh, you know, a fixed amount of transactions on the Bitcoin network itself. Uh, it almost becomes physically impossible to move everybody to the Lightning Network if you, if you kind of just do back of the envelope math and you see how long it would take to actually onboard people from Bitcoin uh, to, to Lightning Network. So, you know, there's, there, there's arguments to be made there. 
Um, but once again, you know, maybe maybe it's just a, a dual world uh, of Bitcoin and Monero um, or something else. Um, but I guess maybe just a slight ch- change of topic. Or do you do you want to go down the fungibility road further? Uh, well, I don't think we've even touched on the fungibility rule okay. yet, but, um, I didn't want to say it without saying it. I mean, do you, do you think, did, do you think one Bitcoin make- equals one Bitcoin on the protocol level, I guess is the easiest way of putting it. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to dive into that, but I want to go backwards just to uh, a statement that you made. Um, so you, you made, you made kind of two different reversal statements and one of them I agree with one of them I don't. So, um, you're absolutely right. Um, so like I want the censorship resistance to be on the base layer. Um, and that's what I would consider a weak point in all the other cryptocurrencies is that if you're not resistant on the base layer, you can't be resistant on the top layer. So I, I would agree with that statement. Um, we can we need the base layer to be the hardest it can be, and then we can go up. Um, so I agree with that statement. However, I do believe that uh, privacy can be added on a second layer. So the censorship is there on the first, but I can use it privately on the second. But is the censorship it's- there, though? Because, I mean, uh, you know, privacy... I watched some of your videos. You talked about some of the the major events that happened in history, uh, the major financial events. One of them being the confiscation of gold, right? The confiscation of gold. Um, you know, the confiscation of Bitcoin isn't isn't that crazy of a concept, right? Uh, well, I think I think it is. I, I don't think. I, I well, no, no. Imagine. This this idea that a government may want to do that, right? And then I would let's, say. I, I, I just want to make a point. My, my point is, if, if that were to happen, w- would you want, you know, the powers that be to know that you have that Bitcoin and to be able to surveil and see whether or not it ever moves? Uh, or would you rather have it in a black box? And when, you know, the authorities that be ask for your Bitcoin, you say, well, you know, I lost my private keys They're You know, they're yeah. gone. So um, a couple mm-hmm. things I would say. Uh, first, I, I, I didn't get to finish adding. I mean, so. I don't think uh, I'll, I'll whatever we'll table that conversation. But I don't think anybody, you or any other coin, uh, you know, advocate out there, would argue that Bitcoin isn't the, the strongest, uh, most difficult chain to attack. I mean, it has all the hash power in the world. Yeah, it but I, no, I would out. argue. I would argue. One hundred percent. I would argue against that. Yeah. Oh, so you think it would be cheaper and easier to attack Bitcoin? No, I, I think you could have all the hash power in the world, but if I could, if I could go and pull the plug out of out of your miners, it doesn't work. Or if I could go and knock on the door of the people who are mining, uh, it doesn't matter. If you could have a nuclear power plant powering it. Um, it's not just about the power; it's about the decentralization of the mining right, network but the, and the but mining network being, be, you know, being built in a way where it can't easily easily be co-opted or shut down by authorities. I mean, right yes, now sir. we we saw we're seeing it happen in China in real time, uh, where you know the government can say, "Hey, you know, stop mining," right? And is is it hard for them to find these miners? Absolutely not. Just go see, you know. Which which rooftops uh, have have melted snow on them? Where you know, I mean, are you know which warehouse is is filled with with servers? I mean, Bitcoin mining is uh, is an industrial thing at this stage, and it's not too hard for the government to go in and shut that down when there's just a few players. Uh, not even to mention, you know, the building of ASICs, which is only done by a handful of people. So, you know, Monero has has also in that area, you know, privacy aside, fungibility aside, uh, when we're talking about building censorship resistance into the base layer, they've also done that with mining, with the, you know, uh, basically making it difficult to create ASICs and maintaining the ability of CPUs to mine in a permissionless way. Um, so first off, you know, the, we've we've found over and over again through multiple tests on the Bitcoin network that the miners have, you know, little power over the network. So we saw that in the block size wars, uh, the miners, could, they tried their best, the largest mining pools in the world colluded to try to, you know, split the network, didn't didn't work. Uh, and, and to your point, the China um, issue that just happened, I think, didn't show how vulnerable it was. As a matter of fact, I believe it showed how re- robust it was. And so while a big chunk of mining went off, uh, difficulty went up. Um, just like clockwork, the difficulty adjustment happened, the network uh, found its equilibrium, and life moved on. So um, I think it was actually a testament to the network, uh, not not against it. You don't think governments can have influence over miners? We're already seeing it. We're, we're seeing it even with this you know, idea. Well, we're seeing it in two ways. We're, we're seeing compliant miners, right? Miners that are agreeing to only mine compliant coins that don't have 
uh, include blacklisted wallets. That that equals censorship uh, in a very big way, in the most you know fundamental way possible. And then we're also seeing it with this idea of perhaps uh, you know governments mandating that your your coins need to come from clean energy. Uh, also, you know censorship in, 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 a, in another form, not, not as uh, dangerous as the first. Um, but yeah, just it, why, why is that possible? Because, you know, once again, you know, these, these companies could have a tremendous amount of hashing power. Sure, they could move from China and they can move back into the U.S., but they're always going to be large. They're always going to be using up a ton, a ton of electricity, and they're always going to be, you know, uh, just a door knock away from the, from the government that's in the you know in the jurisdiction where they're mining, and uh, they're gonna they're gonna play ball, right? I mean these these are big corporations now. They're no it's no longer you know Mark or, or Doug mining in their basement. You know it's uh, these are big corporations that have to pay their bills, they have to pay their electricity. They want they and they essentially at the day have the incentive to be compliant and cooperate with the authorities, and we're starting to see that. Okay. You don't, uh, you don't think we're starting to see that? Well, that, I mean, because that was where the tweet thread started. No, obviously, obviously, we are seeing uh, you know big corporations jumping into it. Uh, what's interesting, though, is you know I view that as a as a plus, and and in any 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 overdeveloped strength can also become a weakness. So, to your point, um, having more people jump in and mine it is a good thing, but it also could become a weak point. To your point, right? And and I would agree with that. The future is unknown, and aliens could come back and destroy the world tomorrow. So we could play the the what if game forever, uh, but we'll never get anywhere. It's not really productive. But what I would say is, but it's is not that, a what if, Mark. It's happening. We have, we have, we have you know the marathon, the marathon yeah, patent group. I know, but let me, let me finish my thought. So um, I see that the more people jumping in mining is the better. Now, to your point, let's play that out. To your point, they become so big that the government can lean on them and force them to do malicious things. Right? For example. Well, that's where game theory kicks in. And so let's let's play out the marathon thing, for example, which I guess kind of takes us into this fungibility thing. But uh, marathon, which is what you're talking about, and so for those who aren't familiar with it, is a, is a large mining group. And they have agreed to mine Bitcoin in a government-sponsored, like politically accepted, correct way, um, which would include taking out like blacklisted addresses or whatever. Okay, so um, that, that, that's what you're referring to. Um, the problem is, is that... Game theory, economic theory comes into play. So that's great. They can do that and they can spend $120,000 to mine a Bitcoin. But guess what? The rest of the world is going to mine them for $40,000 today. And guess what? Marathon ain't going to get very far. And so everybody is always working out for their own best interest. And it's actually written in the white paper, right? It's all about having good actors based off of incentives. And so they can hamstring themselves with these ESG narratives and all those things. And they, they can spend $100,000 to mine a Bitcoin, but the rest of the world's going to mine them for $40,000. And so they're not going to get very far. And so um, I just don't see how that game plays out in the long run. I don't see, while I do believe, uh, Big corporations are a little bit stupid these days. They have so much free money, they don't know what to do with it. Um, at the end of the day, uh, they're not in the business to go ahead and just waste billions of dollars um, trying to compete with the rest of the world that can mine them for, for market value. Yeah, I encourage you to read uh, uh, or watch. We actually did a show on it. So Gerard Bednar, he, he wrote a very good uh, blog analyzing the game theory behind it. And he, he you know, and he's he's a beat, he's a real Bitcoiner, you know, he's a, he's a hardcore hardcore Bitcoiner. He obviously also likes Monero. Uh, but he, he paints a very realistic game theory picture as to why compliant miners uh, may prevail. And we're, we're yeah, I, to... I, read, I read his report and um, I, had, I had quite a few points to pick with it. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't make any notes to discuss on this call. The other thing that I would say, though, just real quick, is that um, if 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 the governments or the powers that be or whatever you want to call them, if they really wanted to do something, they need to do it five years ago. We have 18 and a half, 19 million Bitcoin in circulation. We have maybe another 2 million to go. So the 2 million are barely going to make a dent in the 19 million. And uh, the network doesn't care. The network, so you talk about, we'll, we'll jump into the fungibility now. Uh, the fungibility uh, potentially could happen at a merchant level. The network don't care. The network doesn't know anything about fungibility. Every uh, one Bitcoin is equal. And so very quickly, those two million that will 
So Marathon, for example, they have about 6% of the hash power. So of the 2 million, potentially 6 of the 6% of those they could mine. So um, real quick math, what is that? Uh, 60,000, 100,000 100, Bitcoin out of 21 million. They're, that's going to make a difference in the market. So I think it's just a little bit too, too, too little too late at this point. Well, it's, uh, not about the, it's not about the market impact. It's about transactions can be censored. You know, so whether all the once the rest of the the twenty one million are mined, that you know the theory is that the Bitcoin mining network will continue to function, and it's it's going to be mining uh, you know purely transactions at that point, right? So well, not not mi not mining, but processing transactions to your point. Yeah, call yeah, yeah we call it mining, we call it whatever you want. But the so, point so is, the mining a... network will be processing transactions, and if it's doing it in a compliant way. That's no longer censorship resistant. It's no longer in accordance with Satoshi Nakamoto's vision of you know what crypto was supposed to be, as laid out in you know in the in the white paper. It's no longer censorship resistant, peer to peer. Sure, but as soon as soon as those coins are used once or twice, the UTXOs are going to be all mixed up, and you're never going to be able to choose what from what. In addition, as I'm sure you're aware, of being a privacy advocate. We can just go and sprinkle a little bit of dust in any of those coins and just mix them all up anyway. So uh, while it sounds okay on paper, I think when you actually understand a little bit better, you realize it's not really practical, which I think is one reason probably and not to put words in people's mouth. I don't know what's in their brain, but that's probably one reason why Michael Saylor's kind of like playing a game with them. He knows whatever they're trying Michael to do. Michael Saylor just got into Bitcoin like a year ago. So I mean, yeah, I, he's, I an MI, he's an MIT engineer. I, he's one of the smartest people in the world. That's fine, man. Understand. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, follow people based on what they're, you know, where they got their degree from or, you know, uh, you know, Michael Saylor seems very much like a salesman, uh, more than, well, like I, said, I don't want know, to put words uh, in his mouth. I don't know. But, uh, but to, to my point, um, you might, you get the 600,000, whatever ESG coins, uh, within a couple transactions, they're all mixed up and there's no way to pick them up. The, the, the network itself cannot censor. Like I said, merchants could sure. Um, which I think then, you know, like I said, we could kind of segue into that, the fungibility agreement. So, you know, one Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin. And so um, the net, to the network, it doesn't know any different. Now, um, I might go buy this bottle of water, uh, this, this bottle right here. I might go buy it at Costco for 19 bucks or I can go to REI and pay $32 for it. So I can go to different merchants, but I can get the same item. I'm going to pay the same price. And if I was going to give this to you as a gift, it's going to be worth the same thing. I just happen to pay more for it. So, um, you know, a merchant, I guess, could say, well, we have this software and we're not going to accept this, this particular coin because it doesn't have this ESG, you know, history on it or whatever. Uh, but, it, but I just want to make clear, it's not the network that's censoring. It would be a, it would be a merchant at that point. Well, no, it, it could be the miners that are censoring it, though. That's, that's well, the whole. Well, I, I just, I, like I said, I just don't see how it's theoretically yeah. possible. And and, the, and and the you know and the and the merchants as well. That's that's an additional issue, and I'm sure we'll, we'll very much see that. Uh, but the larger issue, I would say, is is the miners. Um, you know, we're 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 seeing blacklisted wallets. It's 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 a, it's a thing. Uh, it's only growing. Uh, this idea that you know. Bitcoin is just going to be able to mix the coins. Um, you know, it, it's a race there and chain analysis, uh, you know, will we'll, all the data is there. It's all laid out. It's all transparent. You get enough enough uh, computers looking at it and running the running it. It's it's pretty easy to unravel. Um, so I don't I, that's that's the concern, you know, that it could always be unraveled. It's currently currently effectively already is. Um, you know, Bitcoin is becoming KYC AML coin. You know, everybody that purchases purchases their Bitcoin, ninety nine point you know nine percent of people these days are getting it through uh, an exchange like Coinbase or wherever, and they're you know you're going through KYC AML, and then forever after, the trail is followed. Um, you know, Monero a little bit different. It's like you went to the bank and you took out cash. Sure. Sure, the teller knows that you're taking out ten grand, but it's not forever following you. They're not forever tracing it. Um, you walk out there with with some liberty, with some liberty in your hand. And you know, I've heard you on your show talk of very much, uh, you know, enthusi uh, not enthusiastically, but uh, emphatically and passionately about you know the fear of the elimination of cash. And I I totally agree with you, and I, I align with those 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 ideas that you speak about. And so you know. 
that's why it's so important that we have the, the right tech to make sure that something like cash still exists when we all move over to the digital world. I agree. I agree with that. Um, I guess the, the part where I don't really um, understand, there, there's one piece that I don't feel like we're caught up on. So I definitely agree with that sentiment. Um, what I said earlier um, about the cup of coffee, you know, um, doesn't need to be broadcast the whole network and immutable for all of history. It's a, it's a stupid cup of coffee. Um, so when you're talking about the merchants and being able to walk around with cash, right, we're talking about small denominations. Um, and so um, if I'm going to be using small denominations, it's obviously not going to be done on the main Bitcoin blockchain. It'd be done on Lightning. As we've already established, I mean, Bit Lightning is private. And uh, you said people don't know, but uh, I think if anyone spends any time, they can figure that out. You and I could set up our own Lightning <laughs> network, and you and I could send money back and forth that no one would ever know. It's as private as it can be. So um, I, all that walking around cash, as you say, would be used for small denominations, which would be done on Lightning. So that would, that would be inherently private right off the bat. The other thing, and so here's where I, here's where I don't get this. So let me lay this out for you. And you can break it down. So um, I can you. So let's just let's we'll table lightning for a minute. But I, that's a big piece that we shouldn't overlook. But um, on Bitcoin, for example, you mentioned coin join. So there's plenty of different options for me to obfuscate the history of the Bitcoin. So I can coin join it. I can mix it. I can hop it. A um, couple things that I can do to obfuscate that history. Um, and so I could go to any merchant I want with an, with no history. Um, and what Monero people have told me, uh, obviously what got this conversation started was that tweet thread. And so what Monero people tell me is, well, um, but Monero is more fungible because it doesn't have a history. So, and, and, and even though you could obfuscate Bitcoin's history, um, the merchant wouldn't accept it because there's no history. So my question is, well, if they can't, and so there is this travel rule that they're trying to implement, right? Um, the FTF is putting this travel rule in where they want to know that history. So if they won't accept the Bitcoin because there's no history, why would they accept the Monero with no history? Well, it's not that they won't. They, why wouldn't they accept? I, I'm not really following your uh, your logic there. So you're saying um, governments. Well, you're basically saying governments would outlaw or ban I'm a merchant, use. A merchant, so a, merchant, a merchant says, hey, we're not going to accept that Bitcoin from you. It's not fungible because it's not an ESG coin. Well, or, no, it's, it's that they wouldn't accept it because it does have a history attached to it. Not because I, well, why it don't I just obfuscate the history? Because you, you can't. It's not that easy. Of course I can. There's plenty of tools to do well, that. Well, when you coin join it, now you've just added additional history. Now you're definitely getting blacklisted, right? So I can coin as, join it. As soon it, as I can you coin it, join it, it then, then you're marked. You're marked as somebody who used, who opted in to a service. This is not, now, you're get, now you're going down a, a very uh, shady legal road, right? So now you're intentionally trying to uh, mix your coins. You're kind of trying to launder your coins through a mixer. Uh, as opposed to it being built into the protocol, where you're not then opting into that service. That's that's the pro that's that's one of the fundamental issues. Is that we don't want the protocol to be one when you want to be anonymous or you want to be private. Now you're opting into it. Now by way of opting into it, you, in some in some eyes, you're committing a crime. We've already seen that with CoinJoin. They're coming down on CoinJoin. They they see that as as mixing services that are essentially you know, not allowed, uh, depending on what, you know, what legal uh, jurisdiction you're in. Uh, I mean, but if, it, if it's built, happen. if it's built into the framework, into, you know, the base layer, uh, now you're no longer opting in, but it's the default. It's now it's the default. I think, uh, I think you're stepping over the problem. And the problem is, is the FTF ruling, right? Which is this travel rule where they want to know the history, um, know your customer, KYC, et cetera. So in order to do, in order for any licensed business, which is a bigger problem in the first place, licensed and unlicensed, but in order for licensed business um, to do, do transactions, especially over $10,000 USD, um, they have to have that history. And so um, per this FTF travel rule that they're trying to see if they can get into cryptocurrency, um, they can't accept the transaction without knowing the history. So whether the history is not there natively or it's been hidden uh, with a service, the diff it doesn't really matter because per the rule, it must have a history. Yeah, but so we're, we're, we're not way, here. We're not here to follow rules, Mark. We we're not building crypto to go follow rules. But, um, but, so uh, that, you know, I, I, I think that rule that rule is a, is a big problem. Uh, I don't think it's going to fly, and it's it's unfair when you look at it compared to the rules we've had with cash. Um, so why I is agree. a different why is a different standard being used for crypto 
versus cash. I agree. That's the problem. I agree. It's not a problem. So you agree. then don't you then don't you know create a, a protocol that's more friendly to the regulators at that, no, at that I agree. time. I agree, but but I thought that was the argument you were making. So you were saying that uh, Bitcoin isn't fungible because people won't fall. People are going to follow the rules and won't accept it. And so I was just chasing your argument down. Now you're saying forget the rules, which I would agree with. I would also agree with forget the rules. But if we're going to forget the rules, then all Bitcoin's fungible, right? So it's like this like circular argument kind of a thing. Well, no, because people have the mechanisms to more easily implement and follow the rules and automate the rules on Bitcoin. Whereas Monero is resistant to uh, basically bending the knee towards those rules because they don't have the technology to implement right. it. So, so one is native, it doesn't have a history. One, you have to use a service to hide the history. At the end result, they both don't have a history. Now, uh, you're saying a merchant would say, well, we, we, we can accept one that doesn't have a history natively, but we can't accept one that doesn't have a history because you obfuscated it. And so that's where it's like that circular uh, theory where it's like, well, are we following the rules or are we not following the rules? Because if the rule says it has to have a history, whether it's native or not, it has to have a history. Or we don't follow the rules, which in that case, it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not totally following your your your. Well, uh, okay, so so you, your your argument was that Bitcoin's not fungible mm -hmm. because you can see a history. Correct. Different histories would make different coins work differently, right? That's that's the base argument. So we're we're there. So. Basically, a merchant could say, well, we can't accept a tainted coin, but we can accept a clean coin, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Absolutely. per this, and that, that, that would be because of like a travel rule where they have to know the history. And so because they know the rule, the history, they'd say, oh, that's tainted, we can't take it, or that's a good coin, we can't, right? So that's the argument with Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So what I'm saying is, what if I delete the history? And yeah, but you, you can't. But the whole point is, you can't delete the sure, history. It's sure, through, sure. through the act of deleting the history, you're creating more history. You're, there, there's more. It's right. showing okay. that that you went through the process of trying to delete the history. So right. now it's so, marked as somebody who tried to delete history. So, so it, it uh, just doesn't. It doesn't okay, work. Okay. So 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 we can. So if we can hide the history, there's no history. Well, something there is some history, but we can't. We're not quite sure. So we can't accept that, or but but I can accept a coin that has no history. You yes. see what I'm saying? So both, both coins would have no history, which would defeat the whole rule in the first place. Okay, I mean I disagree with you there, but let, let's move on. My my point is, it's still you're not you, you can't hide the history. And then through the act of trying to hide the history of Bitcoin, you're basically opting into it, and you're saying to the world, "Hey, I'm trying to hide the history." And if there, even if the history is hidden. You, it shows that you went through the act of trying to hide the history, and you're now but marked that, but, in that form. So you're but, it's still but, but it's still gone. But it's still it, it's, you can tell that it's been obfuscated, but it's still gone. Versus but, but, having. But no why? Why? Why should we even be okay with the fact that you could taint it and mark it in that way? I mean, you know, that's just that's where you know I th I think the flaw the flaw is, and you know, some would look at it and say, you know, the Michael Sailors of the world may even start to make arguments as to why that's a good thing. You know, all right. So this is this is what corporations want. This is why they're putting it on their balance sheets because they don't want to put something on their balance sheet that may have a nefarious history. So oh, it's you can look at it. You can find the clean bitcoins, like like cash's history. What ninety five percent of dollars? But my cocaine. point <laughs> is, you're starting to see uh, people make arguments as to why that might even be a good thing, which I th I personally think is a scary argument to make because I don't want. But who knows? Maybe we have compliant Bitcoin, and then we have. Monero, I, you know, that's that seems to be the direction we're moving in. I mean, I'm sure you've seen the dark, the dark markets are all moving over to Monero. And you would have to be an idiot to go on the dark market today and use Bitcoin, even if you're a master at, uh, you know, using CoinJoin or whatever it is. But wh why? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just use something that has it uh, built in? So we're seeing real usage, uh, you know, back to your arguments as to watching technology and watch as it evolves. Uh, you know, Monero has very real organic usage and use cases. It's not it's not one of these coins where it's, you know, maybe used for this someday. It's literally living up to the value proposition of censorship resistant. And it's used in that manner more so than Bitcoin. And if you had to use something, you would be a fool not to use it versus using Bitcoin in that circumstance, which, you know, you could. Just completely disregard the dark market, and you know we could say it's uh, you know 
I wish it didn't exist in the first place because nefarious things take place there. But it shows that, you know, if it can pass that test, then it can pass any test in, in those yeah. terms. I would, I would agree with you on that. I mean, uh, all this talk about it's only used by criminals only further proves its use case, right? So uh, I would agree with you on that point. Um, I would say, though, the other thing, going back to kind of the history of monetary systems, is that when you study kind of the history, um, you understand it started with barter, right? Uh, the problem with barter is divisibility being one, but also really it's sellability. And so, like, not everybody wants my cow. That's a problem. And so money has to be widely accepted. And so, you know, one of the other big problems, uh, and again, everything has trade-offs and you can optimize for whatever you want to optimize for. And so while uh, Monero might be better in the dark markets, it's not, not near as widely accepted. Um, there's not near as many places to buy it uh, or sell it um, or use it. And so um, at some point, maybe there will be. And uh, I am a privacy advocate and I would uh, love to see, be, I would love to continue to use money in a private way. I think uh, back to kind of what your comment was uh, now, like who are we to, or we're not talking about following the rules. And I would agree the rules are stupid and they should be um, abolished. And, and I hope that's the case at some point. And uh, you know, I think that all, I think the privacy is a human right. We should all be able to transact uh, with privacy, um, but we need to be able to do that. And we need to have a money that's you know, widely accepted to do that, not just in small use cases. And so, um, you know, maybe, maybe, Mon maybe Monero will get there one day, but, for now, having that very limited sellability, it's also a problem. Yeah, it's, you know, liquidity issue, network effect. I've seen, you know, your videos on it as well where arguments were made against Bitcoin as to whether or not it could achieve, you know, network effects. So, you know, I, I don't see why, you know, if, if Bitcoin is crossing the, the chasm, um, I don't see why Monero can't go through that same process and also achieving network effect. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, bridges being built into the Monero uh, ecosystem or onto the Monero chain. Right. So atomic swaps, I'm sure you're familiar with. So that's pretty much unstoppable decentralized technology. So allowing people to uh, swap between Bitcoin and Monero, not theoretical, uh, you know, uh, they're building it right now. They've built uh, versions that are working. It's just not, you know, uh, up and running in a big way yet. Um, there's Thorchain is another one. There's the se secret network. There's uh, decentralized exchanges, BISC, and there's a new one, Havino, uh, that's being built where Monero is going to be the, the primary uh, base coin. Um, so, you know, the liquidity, uh, I think, really seems to be something that, knock on wood, won't be a problem. Uh, you know, whether or not governments want to delist, uh, ask exchanges to delist coins. Um, it, there's going to be inroads. And I just have to say too, you know, Justin Earnhoff, he's, I, I recommend you, uh, you know, following him on Twitter if you don't already. Uh, he's more eloquent than I am regarding Monero and, and really understands this stuff. He sees the trend moving towards Monero uh, being more adopted on exchanges uh, and that maybe pressure coming from governments, and I hope I'm not putting words in Justin's mouth too much, uh, that, you know, they would want to start accepting Monero because if you're going to look for any heuristic or any way of having any knowledge of somebody using Monero, you're going to want to have people start to come through channels, uh, bridges that you have control over. So, you know, like I said, back to that example, I could go to the bank, I could take out $10,000 cash, but at least the bank now knows I took out $10,000 cash. So there's probably going to be this move towards uh, you know, exchanges listing Monero instead of delisting for those purposes. So I do, I do think those liquidity issues will be overcome. But I, yeah, I, I guess goes back, this goes back to the rules. So you know, and, and unfortunately, um, I think uh, I think you started the show by saying, I mean, we can see the direction the world's going, and it's definitely going more authoritarian. Um, I think we're going to a world of more rules and not less rules. Um, so you know, obviously that's a that's a big piece. Um, and, and, but. Um, I know, I know we got to start wrapping this up, but one other piece also is that, um, you know, not just uh, saleability, liquidity, as, as we just discussed, but also, you know, you look at um, network effects, as, as you mentioned, which is a massive piece because you need, you know, you need to be able to have that liquidity, um, but also the development. And that was another thing, you know, you have some of the biggest, the brightest minds in the world building infrastructure. So remember back to the technology uh, revolutions in the adoption cycle, which is that infrastructure has to be built. And so you see all this infrastructure being built around it. I mean, uh, the leader of the, 
the, the CFO of the world's largest hedge funds left to go join a Bitcoin company. So we're seeing that. And Monero, I, I believe all the, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe all the development, um, which is not a lot of development, but a little bit of development that's being done is all being done kind of like by volunteers. Um, and they raise money to do that somehow. So what do you know? No, it's a lot. Of, it's the third most developed coin. So I, I wouldn't categorize that as a little development. It's very I, much. Like I said, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, no. If, if there's any ago. shortcomings of Monero, it's it's not in its development. Uh, it's being developed. There's breakthroughs in technology happening all the time. Monero. Random X, which I touched on a little bit, which is that new proof of work. I mean, that that's a major breakthrough. And I've had many. Uh, you know, big PTC Maxis uh, on this show, very well-known ones, Andreas Antonopoulos. And, you know, I bring that up and uh, they don't know much about it, which well, surprises like years, me because it's, ago, it's, such was... a, it's such an amazing breakthrough. So my point is there's very strong development on Monero. Sure, is it is it being developed by uh, major corporations? Maybe not as much, but that's starting to happen too. Because once again, it's going through its growth stages. So you're seeing uh, like Cake Wallet is, uh, you know, one of the uh, the major wallets, if not probably is the biggest wallet. They sponsor this show, by the way, is the biggest wallet in Monero, open source. Uh, but they've gained, uh, they've grown quite well. And, you know, they contribute a lot to uh, development. They put dollars towards that. Uh, other companies, Globy, Fluffy Pony has... Has uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fluffy Pony, but he's kind of sure. was the lead maintainer of Monero at some point. But now he's, uh, you know, he's developed other companies and he puts a lot of funding and you know. So the, the, there's there's companies just like Bitcoin, you know, it's just maybe a little earlier in its in its stages in terms of um, outside players or corporations stepping in to develop. But it, it's certainly happening. Cool. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, First off, thanks for being a sport, man. I really appreciate you know. I'm, I know yeah, we're I uh, just hammering it right, but that's what that's what happens on Monero talk. You know, we just hammer well, right. I, I believe it's it's super important. I'm all, I'm I'm all for free speech, and uh, we, that's how we learn, right? We learn through yeah. discussion. We sharpen our arguments, and and uh, I'm always open to you know changing my mind if there's information provided that I don't see. Uh, but yeah, I'm always open for a for a good, open, honest discussion. And I know you, you have a tremendous platform. So, you know, anytime you want to do a Monero show, you know, with, I know you said as a, well, not, don't come on my platform because I, which I get it, you know, that that's value there. And I get, you don't want to uh, spread misinformation, but if you ever, well, it doesn't have to be me. You could have uh, Justin on or uh, you, you How, Howard the, You notice, I mean, you, you've mentioned, you've seen several of my videos. I don't even really openly promote Bitcoin as much meaning like I never you've, you've never seen me discuss the technical aspects of Bitcoin and how it works and why it's superior gotcha. I talk about I talk about why we need it mm -hmm. and so mostly talking about the Fed mostly talking about uh, privacy issues and things like that so um, all of that could be you know attributed to why we need cryptocurrencies if you want to apply it that broad um, so I don't break down any cryptocurrency I try to stay more broad as to why we need it as a whole um, as opposed to why we need any specific coin over another. Uh, but yeah, of course, I say buy Bitcoin. You definitely do a great, great job on your show communicating. Um, you're, you're very salient with your points, very clear. Your videos are hot. You know, they're, they're great. Because um, even, even with Monero, you know, I mean, whatever, whatever it may be that you're into, most people, and I'm sure you would agree, most people, especially in the United States, don't realize why they need privacy. Yeah. Don't realize that their cash exactly. is under attack. Don't, so, so that's really what I'm trying to bring attention to, as opposed to like trying to channel it into any one specific platform. But uh, I do want to bring up—I know you, you probably have to go—but I want to bring up one more quick topic. Well, yeah. it could be a long topic. But we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll make it quick. Um, you know, the the central bank coins that we're starting to see, and they're really starting to catch steam now. It looks like China is going to be releasing it before anybody else. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that and, you know, how that's going to affect the ecosystem, what that means for projects like Bitcoin and Monero? We'd just love to hear you uh, get your opinion. Sure. Well, well, we do know China is well ahead of the game for sure, right? So they released theirs to the wild in October of 2020, um, and their plan is to have it fully out and functional by the Olympics of next year. It's kind of like this, uh, you know, James Bond villain movie where, like, let's invite all the world leaders to this location, right? So like, let's invite the whole world to the Olympics and then we're going to unleash our, our coin and give it to everybody there. Um, so we know that they're doing that. Um, and so they're, they're well ahead. Um, they have come out and really increased their marketing. Um, and in one of those videos I intercepted uh, in Chinese, 
um, they were basically saying like this is a way that the countries can circumvent the SWIFT system, get around the dollar. It was pretty bad, and I think that really lit a fire under the ass of the Federal Reserve and, and President Biden administration. Um, so we know now the Fed has stepped up their efforts to do that as well. Overall, from a from a big level pers- uh, perspective, not just um, looking at any one specifically, but overall, it's very scary and it's very dangerous. I mean, just as you made the case, and I agree with you, we need cash, right? We need privacy. Um, it's the exact opposite of privacy. Um, not only is it programmable money where, you know, hey, here's a thousand dollar stimulus. If you don't spend it by Friday, you lose it. It's also behavioral, right? And so they think they can affect our behavior. So, hey, you're in a minority group or a, a ethnic group or whatever. You get extra money. Oh, hey, Doug, you, you're not you're not saving enough. You have an interest rate mark. You're saving too much. You have negative interest rates. Um, so there's all these things they can do, you know, reparations, whatever they want, behavioral modifications through that. It's also, you know, it's a complete surveillance and behavioral tool. And, uh, of course, uh, what is the, the, you know, any Fed or police would say uh, anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, I would say it's kind of like that with the money. Like anything they can do with the money to use against you, they're probably going to do it. Um, so it's very bad, in my opinion. It's scary. It's bad. Um, what do I think that means to the overall ecosystem? I think at the end of the day, I think it's a good thing. And the reason why I think it's a good thing is that, um, as you're well aware, I'm sure there's still lots of people who are very skeptical on cryptocurrency in general, Bitcoin or whatever coin you want to call it. And so I, I can't trust this digital thing, this digital coin that doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get it. It's not real. It's not tangible, et cetera. And so Although about 95% of all transactions, dollar transactions are digitally anyway. I barely carry cash around anyway anymore. So even though we live in that, most people still don't think they can have this digital money. So I think getting that the Fed coin or the dollar digital coin or whatever you want to call it, I think it gives it a legitimacy. And next thing you know, now people are used to dealing with their wallets and sending digital coins. And so now they kind of start to see it as real. And then um, I believe then they'll see it comparatively against Bitcoin. Oh, so now I understand these digital coins. Well, what's different about this than Bitcoin or Monero or whatever coin? Oh, Monero is more private. Like Bitcoin's uh, censorship resistant. Bitcoin has a fixed cap, whatever it may be. And they'll see Bitcoin going up in value as their Fed coins are going down in value. And they're going to go, shoot, well, what are we doing over here? Let's go ahead and jump over there. So I think at the end of the day, it's going to end up being like a gateway drug. Um, It'll get people warmed up to the idea. And then they'll see the comparison and they'll be jumping over yeah, I, I totally agree with you in those terms. Yeah, I think if anything, it's it's good for crypto overall for all those reasons you're saying. I do think maybe, uh, you know, I don't, know, I don't want to open up a debate, but maybe, it, it, uh, you know, uh, a central bank coin can maybe more closely mimic the value proposition of what Bitcoin has become versus what something like Monero is, right? So really what people are, they're not, like we said, they're not using it to transact right now. Sure, Lightning Network, but... Really, it's being sold as digital gold. You know, don't don't even move your Bitcoin. You don't have to. Just hold it. Don't even don't even transact it. Um, and it's really a, become a, a store of value. And so, a central bank coin might be able to compete on on that end, right? We're saying, you know, we you I don't know, I don't think it will value here. Well, if, if, if they can if they can instill trust in the emission of the coin, and you know, there's things to do. But what they will never do, and I think we could agree on this, they'll never, they're never going to be able to compete uh, on the uh, on the on the concept of, of privacy, right? Because a government's not going to not going to give that one up. They're not going to well, then implement um, in the, privacy. In the, in the in the five Fed pilot coin, they're doing five pilots right now. Um, they've talked about you know having privacy in there. Well, but selective point, privacy, right? No, privacy, no, no, yeah. To, to your point, of course, they're never going to try to give more of that back to you. I would agree with you on that. But I also would equally agree. I would actually agree they would probably give you privacy. If they were forced between two decisions, should we give them privacy or we give them a fixed supply cap that we can never print more of? They would probably opt to give you privacy if they had to choose between the two. They will never choose to live on a budget. The government has to create money out of thin air. And so because of that – because of that inflation that's built in, that just it's it, it inflation steals value. It, it steals wealth from you, um, and so they'll never choose to give up their money printer. They'd rather give you privacy back because you already have it with cash anyway. Um, it's theoretical, of course. They're going to give you neither. Um, but uh, my point being is that they'll never compete with Bitcoin because Bitcoin has the twenty-one million supply cap. 
Yeah, yeah. We never know. Yeah, they would never give you data. They're not giving you they, they may give you privacy, but they're not giving you privacy. Um, like <laughs> it, this is this is great. Really appreciate it. Once again, thanks for being a great sport. Um, yeah, you're, down, you're down in Puerto Rico, right? Yeah, in Puerto Rico. What, was that for crypto reasons? Is that why you? Uh, or... uh, you know, it was. Um, I, I mean, not not crypto necessarily, but it was tax optimization for sure. Um, you know, coming from California, taxes are outrageous. It's the it's the, it's, it's the worst in the nation, um, and not just taxes, but every tax. So car registration is a thousand bucks, but in another state, it's a hundred bucks. I mean, gas is twice as much, et cetera. And so, you know, you got to a point with, you know, the whole COVID lockdowns and whatnot. And, uh, you know, the whole state, California was also one of the strictest states in the nation. So the whole state's locked down. Um, the kids can't go to school. Um, and it's like, what the heck are we even doing here? Why don't we try to go live somewhere else for a year? Um, see if we like it. And so we thought, oh, if, if I was going to go to Texas or I was going to go to Florida, which both sound like pretty good places, I don't know anyone in Texas. I don't know anyone in Florida. Why not just go all the way to Puerto Rico? It's a beautiful island in the Caribbean. And of course, the tax structure is very, very attractive. And so, yeah, we, we gave it a shot. Awesome, man. Well, Sunita and I might be making our way down there soon as well. So uh, maybe even, beautiful- even just for visiting, per- we go down there a lot. Sunita's half Puerto Rican. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe we grab a drink. Grab a drink on the yeah. beach one of these days. Yeah, for sure. That'd be great. All right, man. Thanks again. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.